Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Maria Diekmann. She was born in the United States, but has spent more than half her life in Namibia and raised her three children there. She started, she started REST, R-E-S-T, in 2000 to help protect and study virtually unknown animals like vultures, bats, and pangolins. So first off, thank you for your work, and second, uh, thank you for being on the program. That's a pleasure. So, um, would you rather start by talking about rest or talking about pangolins? Well, pangolins are a huge part of rest, but I can start by talking about rest. Um, it stands for the Rare and Endangered Species Trust, and it's located in southern Africa, in Namibia, a country just above South Africa and just below Angola. And we basically started the organization to help those species or those animals that pretty much either people don't know about or people haven't really cared about. Um, vultures, bats, tortoises, um, you know, certain little antelopes, frogs, a snake, um, and of course the pangolin are all species that until recently um, very few people have known anything about any of them. And so let's let's then start, we can talk about the others too, but let's start with the pangolins. Um, who are they? What's their range? What's their historical um, population? And what is what is so great about them? And what is happening to them? Well, those are all really good questions, and some of them I can answer. But other ones, just we simply don't know anything about penguins. It's a small little creature, about the size of an armadillo in America, and very similar. To an armadillo and that it's got scales. It's the only mammal with scales, so she gives live birth to one little pup and um, suckles him just like a human would or an elephant would. Um, and they're just stunning little creatures. They're very, very intelligent. They have a small head, and usually a small head indicates an animal that's not as intelligent as, as maybe some of the others, but they're incredibly intelligent, very good problem solvers. But they're very, very shy animals. They are mainly nocturnal, but not entirely nocturnal. And if you try to study them or follow them, um, they roll up in a ball, they stress, they can die. Very, very few people have ever managed to hold them in captivity. Um, we are one of three organizations in the world that has managed, two in Zimbabwe and myself, for any length of time, because they simply just get frightened, roll up in a ball, dehydrate, and die within about two weeks. So it's a fascinating little animal. The problem that we're having in recent years is twofold. One, nobody knows about these animals, from the general public to researchers, because they're not high-profile animals, because they've been so scarce and, and not easy to track or monitor or study or even measure. You know, you can't even open them up. They're so, so strong when they roll up in that ball that you can't open them up. So they haven't gained a lot of attention. Um, unfortunately, what they have done in the last couple of years is gained a lot of attention in Asia, simply because uh, the scales are used for various um, traditional beliefs. I won't call them medicinal beliefs because there is no medicinal value in a scale that is any different than a fingernail. Their scales, the scales of a pangolin, are 100% carotene just like your fingernails. They grow like our finger, human fingernails. They break off like our human fingernails. So essentially they're exactly the same as a human fingernail. So the fact that anyone would believe that they have medicinal properties means that you could simply chew your fingernails and not uh, you know, grind up pangolin scales. So they're in a situation at the moment that's dire. Um, it seems to be that they're replacing rhino horn. Rhino horn is getting very hard to get. Armies are going out in South Africa, you know, uh, and and all over the world. <clears throat> People are really, really aware of rhino horn and elephant tusks. So the pangolin's sort of been able to slip through, and uh, it's become more of a problem than even we as researchers realize because we're suddenly finding shipments of tens of thousands of tons of scales, which means hundreds of thousands of pangolins, and we've literally got an animal probably on the brink of extinction without even knowing anything about it. So it's it's pretty pretty bad situation. No pangolin, uh, African pangolin, has ever been captive bred. We 
don't know the dry de- dry de- gest- gestation of a, of a pangolin. So we don't even know how long it takes for a pangolin to be pregnant. Um, we assume she only gives birth to one pup because most of us have only ever seen one pup, but perhaps once in a while they could have twins. Nobody in the world, I think, other than us, know how they actually mate. Um, so there's a lot of really good questions out there, you know, looking at home range and and what they eat and where they eat and where they can habitat and are they solitary or do they sometimes live, live in groups? Those are all questions nobody in the world can answer. Um, so I know you said that we can't answer these questions, but can you give a rough idea of, of range? Like how far north do they extend at all? Does anybody have... I mean, I presume... I mean, just to be absurd, I presume that they're not in the middle of Germany. You know, I mean, they're... Where, what is the general, you know, at least countries where they might be? Well, there's four species in Asia, which are pretty much extinct um, because of the, the trade in them. And there's four species in Africa. We're dealing in Namibia with the only species that can actually live in an arid um, climate. It's called the Cape pangolin or the ground pangolin. Um, a stunning, stunning little creature. Um, incredibly um, independent um, not ferocious at all. They've got no teeth. They have this tongue that's almost as long as the body that they stick down holes and they mainly eat ants, sometimes termites. Most of the information that you'll get out of the books doesn't um, agree with, most books don't agree with each other, and I disagree with most of the books. So um, it, it, it's quite an interesting phenomenon. But You've got them only in Africa, only in Asia, and like I said, the Asian ones are, are in serious trouble, and now the Asian market is, is making the African ones in serious trouble. As far as numbers, we've got no idea. Because it's such a, um, a rare animal. I mean, there are people, there are tour guides that have been touring Africa with guests for their entire lives. We're talking 30, 40, 50 years, and they come and they're spellbound when they see one of my pangolins. Um, if I happen to have one that that is not afraid of people at the time that I've maybe raised and we're preparing her for release or him for release and they're able to see this animal and, and or walk behind it as it naturally walks in the environment, um, they're spellbound because it's just an animal that you just don't see and they're just so gentle and they're so loving. So uh, I, I know this is irrelevant to the larger, to the larger issue, but um, I remember seeing a video of a pangolin going and opening a refrigerator door and uh, and helping itself to what's <laughs> in the refrigerator. So just saying that in terms of being able to open the door, that's that's a that's a fairly um, you said they're good problem solvers. Yeah, if you see a video of pangolins or see pangolins on a television show, we've worked over a lot of film crews. It's probably one of my pangolins. Um, what opening the fridge, unfortunately, is my girl. She, because we're moving, she was in my house. Um, we usually have them in very secure sort of pangolin um, built centers. But with the move, she, she's been in my house. And she immediately learned where some food was. And she learned how to open that fridge. And it only forced. Um, they learned how to crawl onto my bed. They learned how to escape out of windows. Um, I've had penguins climb curtains. They're incredibly agile animals. They use their tail basically as a hand to, to push up or to pull down. So they've got a really, really strong tail. And, yeah, as you saw in that video, um, really, really intelligent animals. So let's go, let's go back to the, to, the, to the slaughter of them. Do they – how, how – um... How are they? How are they primarily killed? Are they killed one by one? Are they poisoned? How do they? How do they? What? What? What are the exact threats? Well, basically, what we think happens for the most part is we've got a lot of um, impoverished people in, in Africa, um, particularly in our country too. Although our country is one of the most prosperous in Southern Africa, but you've got a lot of people that are maybe cutting bush. We've got a lot of alien thorn bush that um, farmers will want cut off. And so you've got a lot of people in the bush or walking in the bush fixing fences, and they've got time on their hands. So all they have to do is look in every single hole, and eventually they'll find a pangolin. The perception is that when you find that pangolin, you're going to be a wealthy man. 
uh, or woman that you're going to you know, be able to sell this for a fortune. And, and that's actually a misperception because while they go for quite a high price in a restaurant in Hong Kong, the guy in the field, as with most uh, enterprises, doesn't get much. So I'm often approached to buy a pangolin. Um, I refuse to buy a pangolin. I will not buy a pangolin as much as it breaks my heart if I can't save that individual. But as soon as I pay for a pangolin, I have stimulated the market. And that guy's going to go back out. You know, and I suddenly got a thousand rand. Uh, what's that? Probably about a, a seventy-five dollars uh, U.S. dollars in his pocket, and and he's going to go out and he's going to technically go out and search for more and more pangolins so that he can sell me more and more. So it's a bit of a catch-22 in that regard. But once they find them in the hole, now these pangolins, remember, are incredibly, incredibly strong, even though they're small. So they push themselves in that hole, and they, they're very hard to get out. Um, often their legs come are broken when they come to me, uh, or they've got some serious internal damage. Sometimes people find them on the roads, this time of year, it's our winter, so the grasses are low, uh, and and pangolins are sometimes found on the side of the roads. I've actually had two come in to me last week. One had been uh, run over um, and had some internal injuries and unfortunately died a couple of days later, and the, the large female, who I'm sure was pregnant, um, was able to be released back out in the wild in a, in a secure area. But for the most part, it's just luck. You go along, you find a pangolin uh, in a hole, and you, you find one way or another to pull it out. For the Asian market, it doesn't matter if it's alive or dead. So, uh, you know, that's not a priority for them is keeping them alive. And they are virtually impossible to keep alive in pet captivity. This is not a pet. Um, you know, we've been really, really successful, uh, particularly raising. I've now raised two babies, and I think there's only one other, one other woman in the world who's, who's managed to raise two baby cape pangolins successfully. One I've managed to get out back out into the wild. The other one who happened to open up a couple of months ago is, is still with me. She'll probably be with me for a couple of years before she's ready to come back out of the wild. So what what do you do? How do you you end up with the ones that are um that are uh hit by a car or something? How what how do you what what do you do at the at the at rest? You know, I end up with all kinds of creatures that are either babies um, that are injured or particularly with pangolins that come off the black market. So I work very strongly with the police and our protective resource unit in the media, which is our nature conservation unit, and the public knows about us. We're a very small country. So if they find a pangolin, if they confiscate a pangolin, it's given to me because they pretty much know that no one else in the, in, in the country is going to be able to, to, to raise it or heal it or do whatever needs to be done. Um, we, we also don't have luck all the time. It's such an unusual creature that while I can see when it's dying um, and I can see the symptoms, I don't know what the causes are sometimes. Uh, I don't know if it's de dehydration. I don't know if it's stress. The little boy that just recently died, we actually gave his body over to a huge international team of vets and scientists, some from, from America, to actually just look at the inside of the pangolin and where the veins are and where the bones are and how the systems work um, because nobody, nobody really knows that kind of stuff. We're really breaking ground with the pangolin. And, um, yeah, that's... That's, that's sort of all of the challenges that go, that go with that. But when I get them, they're usually not in good shape. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a matter of doing the best we can. Um, when I've got little ones, it's 24 hours a day. When I've got a little pangolin, I'll be with that pangolin probably a good mm, 20 hours a day for two years. No joke. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's a huge commitment. So how how do you you said a little pangolin for two years? How I know we don't know much about them, so I'm sorry if I keep throwing questions at you that are people just don't know. But no. how long how long do they live normally, and how long is their is their childhood and youth? Nobody knows how long they live. If I had to take a guess, I'm going to say between eight and ten years, but that's an absolute guess. Uh, it could be five, it could be twenty, but I'm going to guess between about eight and ten. 
Um, they're tiny when they're born. Um, many of the books will tell you that their scales are soft and pink and it's absolute nonsense. Those are premature babies. I think most researchers in the past have seen premature babies because the mother's under stress and she gives birth early. Uh, a true, true birth is actually the penguin comes out with hard um, sort of silvery gray scales and he starts suckling right away on the mother. Um, so, sorry, I, I forgot how you <laughs> I forgot how long they live. Yeah, that's, that's my guess. Um, the rest of it, we just don't know. I mean, I, any question you ask me, for the most part, I'm going to, I'm going to give you my best guess. Um, but when I get a baby in, our method is, and I think we're the only ones in the world to do this, is we get them back out into the bush. So I want them eating what they should be eating in the wild, which is mainly ants. So we walk a pangolin about three to five hours every single day, every individual pangolin. They've got to have people that we trust. Uh, the pangolins have to trust the people. The people have to know what they're doing. But I've got a lot of young students and a lot of young volunteers that come out here, and they're happy to walk around the African bush following a pangolin for a couple of hours. We document everything they eat, so we know what species of ants they're eating. And as you said, with the territory, we've only got a sample size of two now, two babies that we've raised, but we're able to look at exactly how far they're going, um, where they're going, how often do they visit the same ant um, hills. You know, do, does their territory get bigger as they get older? Yes, it does. And a pangolin can walk about... If it's, if it's on the move, looking for our territory, it can walk 10 kilometers a night. Um, but for the most part, I think most pangolins that, f that find a territory, again, I'm making a bit of a thumb, guess, a thumb suck guess, but I think I'm pretty accurate, will probably be about a, t a two miles, a square two mile. Um, will be their home range. If another pangolin comes into that range, we're not sure what happens. We think that that pangolin will chase, you know, the, the, the pangolin whose territory it is will chase the other one out. And what about gestation? How, how long, and, and you said early on, I believe you said that we don't even know if they gather in groups. Like, okay, I live in bear territory, and I see, I see bears and mother bears and baby bears every single day. And in, mm -hmm. in bears, in black bears in the United States, mother bears are the ones who have a territory and the males basically just go around and they might come around to 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 have sex with the females in the spring, but other than that, the males don't really have a home territory. Is it do we know anything about that? That, that do the do the do the, the female pangolins hang out and the men are they like that or are they different? We've got no idea. I mean, we truly have no idea, not even a guess of an idea. It's, most of the books will tell you that penguins are completely solitary because they're usually found individually. A mother, however, with her young pup, we, I'm going to guess probably until about the age of six months, will be incredibly protective of her, of her pup. Um, a baby is called a pup. So at night she'll circle around it um, and, and he'll curl up inside her. And during the day, once he gets a little bit older, he actually climbs onto her back and he rides just above her head on the top of her shoulders. And she's got perfect balance between her tail and her, and her front feet. And she actually walks on her back feet. She's got four feet, two front, two back. But for the most part, they actually walk on their back feet. So they look like little dinosaurs. And in fact, it's starting to come out. They're probably one of the oldest living creatures still alive, along with the crocodile. So their, their, their history goes way, way, way back. Um, you know, to to way before most of the creatures that are that are on on our land now. But as far as do they come together or not, I don't know. I have found three pangolins, a young one, a middle aged one, and an adult, um, dead along an electric fence. Electric fences often kill pangolins because they hit the electricity and they roll around the, the wire being frightened and they electrocute themselves to death. So that I found the fact, the fact that I found three carcasses within, you know, a 10 meter span, um, you know, that's 30 feet span, is really, really unusual. So what we're doing now is we're going to do some genetics and some DNA tests to see if those animals were related. If those animals were related, 
we've thrown out everything that anyone believes about them being solitary. Then it means that actually they do sometimes form, form groups. Now, whether those groups are mothers with females, and as you say, you know, like bears, the males go out and, and sort of roam while the females have stronger territories, we don't know. But um, but these this genetic results should be quite interesting, and I can't think of another way uh, quickly to, to get such a response than, than finding those three together and, and doing genetic testing on them. Um, apart from the people in Asia who um, eat them for phony medical reasons, uh, who eats pangolins? By which I which I'm really meaning, like lions, wild dogs. Who who normally would eat a pangolin? No one. Their their only predator is man. Maybe a honey badger. I don't know if you know what a honey badger is. It's a stunning little creature who's afraid of absolutely nothing, um, about the size of a medium sized dog, and and they're incredibly strong, um, and very persistent. So perhaps a honey badger could get a pangolin open. There's actually a bit of a side of lions trying to open a pangolin, and they sort of play around with it, and it rolls in a ball, and they get tired, and they leave it, and they come back, and they try to open it up, and, and they simply can't get it open. So really, the pangolin's only predator is man. It's so, only serious predator is man. So you said you said earlier that they're often found in holes. Do they make those holes? Do they um, do they have strong digging claws? Yes, RK Pangolin has incredibly strong front claws. So he's got really, really strong nails, um, the back feet not. And he can dig really, really quickly. They can dig a hole that they can go into that would be, oh, one to two feet in probably within about 45 minutes. Uh, I've seen them do it, certainly overnight. Um, but often they'll go into holes that aardvarks have used or warthogs have made, uh, you know, and some of the other creatures use them. Hyenas, leopards will all do that. So I think everybody sort of shares different spaces at different times of the year. So earlier you mentioned uh, the, um, the I don't remember what you called them, but essentially the police or the, the, the wildlife oh. protection. What is the, what is the status of um, both the official legal status and also the so what's the official legal status on pangolins and then is this is are the are the attempts to stop the uh poaching and um export uh rigorous excuse me rigorously enforced or is it sort of winked at or is it dependent on the area are there strong efforts being made by the state to stop the uh to stop the slaughter well, certainly in our, in our country, Namibia, we have a very strong nature conservation force and a, a very strong police force. The problem with pangolins is they've just been so under the radar. They are officially protected. They're one of our protected species. You're not allowed to trade in them. You're not allowed to have them, to hold them, to transport them, or to ship them anywhere. So that's all on the law books. Unfortunately, for instance, two weeks ago, a, a guy was found with a couple of pangolins in one of the towns, and they got off for, with 300 rand. Now, 300 rand is about 20 U.S. dollars, so that was their penalty. Um, I work really strongly with the police, and they're really trying to upgrade some of the laws and, and get the penalties going so that actually penguins become um, at, are on the same level as rhino and elephant, um, that we actually really start looking at the trade. The problem is everything's happening too, too fast for us. You know, you've got to be a jack of all trades and a master of none, um, which I can do sometimes, but not all the time. So you, you, you've got to focus on law. You've got to focus on education. You've got to focus on your community. You have to focus on your research. You have to focus on your rehabilitation, actual care for the animals. And, uh, you know, sometimes you, you just can't be everywhere all at once. Zimbabwe has gotten really good um, with giving out penalties. That's one of our neighboring countries. There's a woman there um, who used to be an attorney, uh, she's got a wildlife center too. Um, we've worked together before, and she's really pushing on the law. So I'm hoping that our country can sort of follow suit and, and get our laws a little bit stronger um, and our penalties a little bit stronger. What has happened recently, last year the IUCN, that's the, basically the international conservation body of the world um, that determines how endangered an animal is, did two things. 
One, they upgraded the status of the animal from, I think it was least concern, which means, you know, there's no problem with this population, to endangered. The, that immediately gives us the ability to um, justify funding and grants and publicity and, you know, all those kinds of things that, that can get the, the face of the pangolin out there and the, the problems of the pangolins out there. And the second thing they did was the, almost the last sentence in this huge worldwide once a year meeting was, um, the pangolin is now considered the most illegally trafficked animal in the world. Now, while that is a horrible status for the pangolin, it immediately gave the pangolin recognition. Um, soon afterwards, uh, a very famous personality, um, Prince William of the UK, went on to a site and was talking about anti-poaching and some of his work with, with funding anti-poaching uh, efforts. And he basically said, um, you know, rhino, elephant, and pangolin in the same sentence. And everyone went, well, we know what a rhino is. We know what an elephant is. But what the heck is a pangolin? You know, and you, of course, nowadays you just put pangolin in on Google. And, you know, usually you come up on a site uh, like mine that, that gives you some videos and some information and some pictures. And, you know, suddenly we had hits, hits, hits on our Facebook. People suddenly saying, I've never even heard of this animal, but isn't it adorable? The ironic thing about the pangolin is that it doesn't fit the profile of an animal that you would fall in love with. You know, they, 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 scientists go through and they say it has to be fuzzy, has to have big eyes, and has to be really cuddly and, you know, kind of fat and, uh, you know, big paws, and then you're going to fall in love with it. And the pangolin has none of that. He's got a small head, he's got little eyes, he's got this really long tongue like a lizard, but nobody loves lizards. He's got scales. Um, and people look at the pictures that we put on Facebook, and there are people around the world that I've never met, they've never seen a pangolin live, they don't know anything about me or my organization, and they just fall in love with these little creatures. So there's just something really appealing about them, and, uh, and, and hopefully that will go into the fact that we, you know, people start caring about them a little bit more and, and knowing what they are and, you know, doing programs like this where you suddenly reach so many people within, you know, a half hour program um, is exactly what the penguin needs right now. They just need their profile to be up a little bit and, and people caring about them. And then our government will react. So it goes back to your question of, you know, what's happening. Then the magistrates know what's going on. The police know what's going on. The government starts supporting our efforts a little bit more and, and giving higher penalties. And that will slowly stop this, this entire trade because it's got to stop. It's got to stop. We talk about the word in extinction so often that I think we almost become immune as humans to the word extinction. But extinction is serious. It, it's really, really serious. And with the pangolin, it's very, very close. Um, we, you know, uh, last week, I think it was four tons, four tons of penguin scales. Now a penguin weighs, um, I've got to now compute it into pounds, but a penguin, an, an adult penguin weighs about, uh, no, let me think, you about 20 kilo... pounds Okay. In, in kgs. Yeah, it's about eight kgs. I think well, that's about 20 pounds. Um, right. And, you know, if you think four tons. Of pangolin scales. Now that's dead, dry pangolins. So you know you've got to at least uh, half it, and you're talking about a heck of a lot of pangolins on one ship. So you said that things have been moving pretty quickly. Can you can you give us a brief history, as you understand it, of pangolin uh, trafficking? When did when did it when did it kick into gear? Uh, you know, 40 years ago, was there a lot of trafficking? 50 years ago, when did it, when did it really, really start and, and explode? It's really only exploded in the last couple of years. Before this, uh, there were some local eating of pangolins. One of our local tribes believes that if you found a pangolin in the bush because they were so rare, you caught it and you took it to the chief and the chief would throw it in the fire and everyone would eat from the meat and have good luck for a very long period of time. So you had those small instances where pangolins were, were caught and consumed or used as bush meat or some other purpose. But the, this strong trade, this Asian trade, has literally only happened in the last couple of years. 
And as I said before, it totally caught us off guard. We knew that there was a trade, but we weren't really sure how big it was. And then suddenly with this focus on rhino and elephant and looking at shipments and the UK and the US and much of Europe throwing money into anti-poaching because of terrorism aspects and that, and that uh, whole you know, funding aspect of it, suddenly there was a lot of money going into policing and a lot more motivation to police. And as soon as that happened for the rhino and the elephant, they started going onto these ships and they started just finding pangolins. Pangolins are much easier to move. Nobody's looking for pangolins. They're looking for, you know, the sniffer dogs are trained for ivory. They're trained for rhino horn. They're not trained for um, specifically pangolin scale. So we've got to change some of the systems. But for the moment, we're just riding on the back of the elephants and the, and the rhinos. And that's when we suddenly realize, wow, this is much, much worse than what we thought. Uh, you know, if I have to try to compute in my head, off the top of my head, the last couple of years, there's probably been about mm, 30,000 tons of pangolin scales confiscated on maybe eight to 10 ships. Uh, and, you know, that's probably a drop in the bucket. Think of all the ships that are actually getting through with pangolin scales and how many scales are getting on the market. So it's, it's quite a serious scenario. And so 30,000 tons is... How many pounds is that? Thirty thousand tons times two thousand is three hundred thousand, three million. Was that sixty million pounds? Is that right? I think it might no, be. Six. I don't know. I was never good at math. And so, if we presume, <laughs> I might be off by a factor of ten, but let's pretend we aren't. That's sixty million pounds. At if they weigh twenty pounds when they're when they're alive, and if they dry out to half, say. That's uh, ten pounds per would still be that's still six million pangolins for a creature who uh. is not and those are the ones that are, that are discovered and that's for a creature that's not social we we don't think and that has a range of two miles so that would be that's 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 an area of now math is going just going to go crazy and all the math people in the audience are going to go wow he's really stupid but was this 1.2 million square miles that would be denuded of pangolins through that something i mean obviously it's just I don't know. See, see the pants <laughs> but the point is it's a huge range of area that would be that would be yeah. depopulated of pangolins just through that those are just the ones caught that's horrifying now people that are writing articles are saying the pangolin is the animal that will go extinct before we even know what it eats. I mean, you know, that's just crazy. That's just crazy. And it's just such a nice little creature. It doesn't hurt anyone. You know, it doesn't, uh, it's, it's not a predator. It doesn't catch your livestock. It doesn't harm your grasses. Um, it doesn't do anything to the human. Nothing, nothing, nothing. It eats ants. Um, and even then, the ants are actually able to um, uh, produce a, an acid within, I'm estimating, one to three minutes from my research watching pangolins that actually protects the ants. So a pangolin will only stay at one ant place for about anywhere between 30 seconds and three minutes. And then he moves on. So the co even the ant colony is protected. So we're, we're literally talking about a creature that does absolutely no one, um, you know, serious harm or any other creature or the environment, any serious harm, and yet we're decimating it. And you said earlier that you pay attention to how often they return to the same anthill. How often do they return to the same anthill? It's about once every three to four weeks that they'll go within the same area. And I estimate that's the time that it takes the ants to recover and not be producing this formic acid um, so quickly. And even then, they might not be going to the exact same ant uh, place um, because they'll find ants that you and I would never see. It's not just, you know, hills or the big termite hills that we all often think that animals go to. It's just a little hole in the ground. And, you know, he starts digging or she starts digging and within 30 seconds, you know, they've opened up quite a big area and they're down into the eggs or, or just licking, you know, up the ants. Their tongue is, as I said, really long and very sticky. So if they just stick it into the, the ground, many of the ants will just stick onto it and then they just bring it up and swallow it. So it's, it's quite an interesting creature. And also, if they have, if they go back every three or four weeks, this is, you know, I happen to do some, some, uh, research on squirrels last summer that 
a squirrel will now I can't remember the numbers, but I think it's like they will hide. I don't know what it is, you know, twenty twenty six hundred or twenty six thousand, some huge number of 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 acorns through the winter, and they will they find about this number is right. They find about twenty five percent of them. So the point is they have a really good memory. And the same thing with chickadees, mm. little birds, that they will hide lots of seeds all over the place, and they can remember like 25 to 50 percent of them. So the point is the pangolin also has to have a very good memory to be able to remember um, if it goes to each anthill for only you know, 30 seconds or something, and if it goes only every three weeks, that means it knows the location of a lot of anthills. Well, certainly they can also just sniff them out. So they're they're obviously looking for new ones all the all the time, and you know they they walk in a serpentine. They they all walk in one direction, uh, in general. But it's a it's a huge serpentine. But certainly you're correct in that um, at least you know I'm looking at a very small sample size. But you know of all the ones that I've walked behind for longer periods of time, which is pretty much the babies that I've raised, um, and the, that's years of research on each of them. Then they've got their favorite places and they know where those favorite places are. And they don't visit them all the time, but they can beeline straight to that place when they're really hungry. So it's, it's a really good point that you make that they've got a very good long term memory, too. So, can you, tell, can you talk more about the establishment and the, the, the running of the Rare and Endangered Species Trust? Yes, it was established in 2000, the year 2000. And basically, we um, were first working with the Cape Griffin vulture. The Cape Griffin vulture is a vulture found only in southern Africa. It's endemic to our area. It's the largest vulture in the area, um, or the heaviest, and not the largest, but the heaviest. So it's probably flying the highest. And it's Namibia's most endangered species. In fact, I think it's just been declared locally extinct. So I was living on a farm not far from the cliffs where the last Cape Griffins were, and I just wanted to, you know, help somebody, to help somebody else save the vultures. And we had some guests visit us. We had a little tiny guest farm, and I just knew the people as Art and Pris, and lovely, lovely couple. And got sat, sit, sat chatting one one afternoon on the stoop, and I realized that Art was the CEO of. Um, Disney of uh, the wildlife park, which is one of the most amazing wildlife parks in the world um, in California. And Chris was his wife. So we got talking. He had been very involved with the California condor um, project, and the California condor is a vulture, probably one of the most endangered in the world, and probably one of the most amazing conservation efforts that anyone in the world has ever done was bringing back the California condor. I mean, the Americans and the Californians put so much money and time and effort and actually still do into that bird. So it's a pretty phenomenal um, experience. And we got talking, and suddenly I realized, you know, this was sort of the guy of my dreams, you know, as far as a mentor. And I said to him, you know, how do I get somebody to do this that I can help out? And he said, Maria, you don't get somebody else to do it. You've got the passion, you do it. And, I mean, I had not a lot of wildlife experience at that point. So I sort of sat down and put my thinking camp on and talked to a few of the top conservationists in our country, and they all supported the idea, and that's how REST was founded. So it was founded for the vultures. What we did was we started looking at different animals that need support. So the spotted rubber frog is a frog that's virtually unknown, and a dwarf python is a snake that nobody really cares about, but it's a fascinating little snake, and the Damara diptych. Um, the African wild dog, the Cape vulture, and the pangolin became sort of our forgotten five. Well, we were forgotten five, and then nature conservation asked us to add one. So we were forgotten five plus one. So we sort of focused on those species, but as soon as you work with vultures, then you get eagles and owls and, you know, all sorts of little raptors. And, you know, as soon as you work with one snake, then, you know, people think that you're an expert in most snakes. And uh, I'm not a snake expert. I'm not a frog expert. Um, but I'm I'm getting much better with my my vultures and my penguins. And in fact, I'd say we're probably doing some of the some of the best groundbreaking work in the world. Well, the one of the points of of all of my work, and I I don't know if you know this, but as well as this program, I also I write books. And I've got like twenty some books out, and the whole point of all of my writing is to try to 
get people off their butts and to get them to um, <laughs> do something good for the natural world. And so when I hear stories like yours, it makes me really excited and happy. Um, so so can you can you talk just a moment about uh, give give words of encouragement to people who might want to do what you are doing but um, are still talking themselves out of it can you help them can you help shut down those voices telling them not to do it because it's too much it's too scary it's too hard I can never accomplish anything I will never be I don't know enough so can you can you shoot down all those ideas so that they can actually get off their behinds and work it's actually so easy for me to shoot down those ideas because I studied politics at university and was working in politics and actually came to Africa looking at the political situation. Mandela was still in jail. Uh, apartheid was still sort of the, the rule of, of law in, in Southern Africa. And I thought I would be over here for nine months. And then I would go back in the States and I would work in the Senate. And, you know, my friends sort of expected um, invitations to the White House. My life has changed a million, uh, you know, a million percent. And if you have any interest in the environment, and you should, whether you're a computer analyst or, you know, somebody who, who lived with bears like you, you know, the environment is where we live. So if we don't protect our bees and we don't protect our atmosphere and we don't protect our bears and, you know, all of these creatures that we have, we're going to lose our world. Um, so it's vitally, vitally important. And if I can do it, anyone can do it. Um, you know, what is what is, is a matter of, it's just being motivated. You know, I say to people, I think I'm one of the happiest women in the world. I really, really think I am. Um, recently, we've had trouble with, with land. Um, we've had to leave our land. In fact, all of my animals are in temporary cages as we speak um, because we thought we had found a, a beautiful little home bordering our national park. And unfortunately, the gentleman who who sold me a little piece of his farm, um, ended up being someone who shot all of my animals that I released. Oh um, my God. Myself, yeah, it's, it's, it's just been, it's, it's been a nightmare, actually, um, because I, I raise a lot of animals. Um, for me and for rest, absolutely 100% essential. If an animal can go back out into the wild, it goes back out into the wild. I don't need to keep a bird in a cage. I don't need to keep an animal in a in a yard. Um, you know, enough come in and come out that you know I've got an, a strong mother instinct, but I don't need to keep anything. And, and for me to see that animal, if I've spent a year or two years or three years getting it ready for the bush and watching it fly away or watching it walk away or having it give birth to its babies in a hole and then bringing the babies to me a couple months later and just letting me look at them and then going away back out into the bush with them. It's, it's the best feeling in the world. Um, so, you know, anybody who wants to work in the environment can certainly work in the environment. Anybody who doesn't want to work every day in the environment can support those of us that do. Um, you know, read books like your books. Um, you know, get onto the Internet. Watch videos because sometimes they're hilarious, um, you know, of, of our wildlife. Give donations. Um I've got people in the UK, because we don't have a home at the moment, we've found a piece of property, it's ideal. Um, I've taken out a personal bank loan, which I've never done in my life, but there's still an amount of uh, 50,000 pounds, which is about, I think it's about 75,000 US dollars that we need to come up with very, very quickly um, to get this land. So I've got people in the UK that have been going through their houses and selling things on, on eBay. Um, and giving us huge donations or going to all their colleagues at work and, and saying, you know, look at this little funny video of this penguin, you know, this woman, you know, they really just need a home. Um, and they're hard workers and they're not going to take your money and go out and, you know, buy gold jewelry or something like that. Um, it, it, it's hard to get that message across to people because they don't know me personally. And those that do are so wonderfully supportive. Um, but, yeah, the world has to wake up. And, and, and realize that our world is getting very, very fragile. Um, somebody once made the analogy, and I think it's a fascinating analogy. You take an airplane, I love to fly. Um, we fly hang gliders and micro lights and everything in my family. But you take an airplane and you take a couple of pop rivets out of it, and it's still going to fly. 
say you put it on the ground and you take a few more paw privets out and you're still going to be able to take off and land. And the next day you're going to take a few more out and the next day the same. And finally at some point you're going to take out that last paw privet that is essential. The one that, the one that you just it can't lose anymore. And your plane is not going to make it anymore. You are going to crash. So I think that's what we have to realize with our world is that we keep taking these pop rivets out. We keep saying, oh, the bats in, in you know, North uh, East um, America are dying. Well, those bats are eating thousands of insects for the crop people naturally, um, you know, and keeping insects out of the crops. Um, oh, the bees are dying. Well, goodness gracious, it's, uh, it's a lot more than the loss of honey. It's all your citrus farmers are going to lose their pollination. Um, you know, the pangolins dying. Well, goodness gracious, you know, this is one of the most ancient creatures in the world. Um, and, and he's dying because somebody thinks that his scales are an aphrodisiac. Um, you know, we need to wake up and we need to protect our world. And, and you can do it in such small little ways, you know. Go into the Internet, donate ten dollars to some organization you know go to your local spca um you know listen in on your radio show uh you know and just get motivated a little bit and 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 every little bit helps every little bit helps and don't think that a dollar doesn't help somebody a dollar goes a long way here it's times 15 so it's 15 million dollars for me you know don't think that your efforts i've got two little girls in the uk uh, not the uk south africa that wrote to me. Now they're Afrikaans speaking, and they think that their community doesn't know enough about penguins. So this is two little girls, 13 I think, 13 and 14 years old, in school still, and they do a school project, and they do an entire website in Afrikaans, their local language. I give them pictures, and I help them with the wording a little bit, and they're suddenly enriching their entire community. Now if two little girls at 13 years old can do that, then anybody can do it. I mean, they've got a lot to teach us. Well, that would be a wonderful note to end on, but I do want to ask a couple more questions. Um, one of them is you mentioned in passing a moment ago that the mothers will bring you babies. And, you know, my mom has – the one reason that I see all these bears every day is because my mom has a really wonderful relationship with the bears. And the, the bears will do the same thing. The mothers sometimes will bring the babies to show her. And so – that and we don't know what they're thinking, of course, but this happens that they'll bring the tiny, tiny babies up, the, the size of a uh, a large cat. That's how young the babies are. And so, does that you you were saying that the that the mothers will bring the babies back to show you? Isn't that just wonderful? I mean, that's that in itself is reason enough to do this. Yeah, I'm I'm just such a lucky person. You know, the fact that I have raised a couple of penguins. And when you raise a penguin, like my little honey bun now, now her name is Honey Bun. She's named after one of our sponsors whose initials were HB. So that's how she got the name Honey Bun. Now, she crawls up into my bed every single night. It's not because I want to have an animal in my bed. It's because she actually crawls up and lays right in my tummy, um, and, and that's where she would have done with her mother. So I've become mom for her, and I suspect your you know, I mean, what an honor that the bears bring their little cubs. Because while I can't tell you exactly what those bears are thinking, I can tell you that from what I know, bears are very protective, and any mother is protective of a little one. So if, if a mother brings her little one, whether it's a warthog or a pangolin or a bear or an elephant or whatever it is, if she brings that little one to somebody or even allows somebody to look at it closely, um, you know, from, from a yard or so, then she's got absolute faith in you. Absolute faith, and I mean that's that's an honor that all of us can can really relate to and respect. So the the last the last question is, um, so the website is www.restafrica.org, restafrica.org, and can you say how people can either help you do your work or be help pangolins in general? Well, at the moment, like I said, we've got a serious problem with land. So we've um, started a, um, a fundraiser. Um, if you go on to our Facebook or if you go on to our website, you'll get a link to the Facebook. And our Facebook, we update quite regularly. So I try weekly to put on, you know, videos and, and pictures. And they're one of a kind. I mean, everybody uses our videos and pictures because I have this unique opportunity to be with these, with these animals so closely. 
And uh, you can go on and give. It's really, really easy to donate um, and and help us buy a home. Um, it's in a conservancy. We signed a purchase agreement. I've just got to come up with the, the last little money, and I've got to come up with it fairly quickly. Um, and then we're going to have our own home. So that's a good way to just help us in general. And because at the moment we're doing this fundraiser, it's really, really easy to donate. We've also got accounts in the United States. Um, and for, for larger donations, Disney just gave us um, uh, some money. Um, so, you know, we're well supported by, by people that don't support people that aren't legitimate. And, uh, you know, there's ways to take da- tax deductions and all sorts of stuff within the United States. As far as penguins, get on Google. Um, you know, start talking about them. Go around to your colleagues and tell them about this funny little creature and, you know, put his picture up on your notice board at work because it's just all about raising awareness. If I can get people to just know what a pangolin is and not think it's a penguin, um, you know, the, the little sea creature, then, then I feel like I've done doing my job for the day. Well, thank you so much for your work, and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Maria Diekman. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.